I asked them to rename it a mid-career award, and they, um, they didn't go for that. So uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, is what I uh, absolutely forbid uh, my students to do, um, and so it stays in here, and that is uh, try to give three talks in one, which is always a, a potential problem. So end-to-end -end models, before we define them, the, the, it, why? Why now? And uh, several of the reasons are, one, is just the advances in data collection. And this is basically true for almost all modeling, from physical, climate, to all that. It's really been remarkable, particularly for when we talk about fish and upper trophic levels. Uh, the spatially detailed data we're getting now is remarkable. In the old days, you would, you would have a station, and you'd line it up with the flagpole, the tip of the pier, and you'd call that station A. And now you... the solution you have now with geo-referencing stations is really uh, remarkable. The other thing, we've, remote sensing has added a whole synoptic spatial component to this, which has helped greatly. And behavioral measurements. Uh, you've probably all seen these tags on fish, and they dive, and they get eaten, and the tag dives, and the pH drops. And uh, uh, Paula Vina has a great video on that about watching a fish get eaten by another fish and eventually come out the other end. And, uh, as, uh, as detritus. Um, a second reason is computing power continues to increase. And it, you may not appreciate it as much as some of the older folks, but the computing power we have now is remarkable. Uh, when I w first started, uh, we didn't have PCs. There was no Microsoft. There was no email. There was no web. We used a shared computer. In fact, it was a, a deck computer that I don't think they're in business anymore. And uh, we had terminals. Uh, I was the first one in the consulting company to get a hard drive. It was 10 megabytes. And we all gathered around and said, what would you possibly need 10 megabytes of storage for? <laughs> so it's a good thing I'm in fisheries and not computer science, because I would be out of business by now. And then there's been advances in modeling as well. The physics has really advanced with following mesoscale type features, uh, even some grub sub-grid scale uh, things with turbulence and stuff, and they can do it now in decadal long runs. Similarly, in my personal uh, preferences and biases, uh, some would say individual-based approach where you track individual fish has been in advance. Others say uh, perhaps not as much as it should have been. Uh, uh, that remains to be seen. Some of the negatives why people want new models is, um, and I use the word perceived here. There's a perceived fisheries management crisis in the U.S. and perhaps worldwide. Uh, it's debatable whether truly 80 percent of the top predators are gone or not. You all know if you're in fisheries, the Myers, Hilborn, uh, Christensen um, industry that's been developed uh, where they seem to do very well criticizing each other uh, in various forms. Um, Another is that people think part of the reason for that is over-reliance on a single species approach, uh, which those in fisheries, the Magnuson Act is being reauthorized right now, and um, that's probably going to stay. And then there's a lot of pressure to do something else, like ecosystem-based fisheries management. And if you ever go to any of those workshops or meetings, you usually spend the first two-thirds trying to get everyone to agree on a definition, and then the next third planning what you'll do at the next meeting. And that seems to go, that's a bit of a pessimistic view of things, but uh, there seems to be a lot of that going on. Another thing that's changed, and, uh, and I'm going to go through this a little quickly, is uh, uh, the public kind of view of things. We love to live by the coast, uh, and we continue to do that, uh, despite being reminded periodically that uh, hurricanes uh, uh, do come. Uh, there could be overfishing. Uh, I do a lot of in the California Delta, one that's very popular out there. The Water Commission is still arguing, and they haven't noticed there's no water left. Um, and if you, if you know what this is, uh, uh, that's in the Columbia River in Oregon. Uh, that's a barge, and the solution they had was to capture the juvenile salmon, put them in a barge, truck them pound, down past the dams, and release them. Um, I hope there's no engineers in the room, but that's a really bad engineering solution to an ecological problem. Uh, particularly when you have 70% mortality in transit. My daughter hates this one. That's her many years ago, by the way. Uh, she's in college now. This was not far from here. This is a red snapper stock assessment when I was on the panel. 
That was the information sent to us as background information for the stock assessment. And it arrived in a box at my house. And I could not believe it. By the way, these are not single pages. These are each document. So I got the background information and I laid them out head to tail and put my, made my daughter stand there for reference. Things have gotten quite complicated. It's no longer simple in, in, in our world of fisheries management. So what, what's it? It's all email now. It's all email now. Right? It feel, doesn't feel as bad with PDFs, but if you really thought about how much was there. Um, one solution is to look at a modeling approach where you couple a series of models that go from bottom up and top down, even sideways out, whatever you want to call it, that enable you to model the system vertically from climate up through the, the fissures, which is the correct term to use. A version of that are end-to-end -end models, and one of your faculty members is famous for uh, working with Atlantis and Ecosim, which are kind of versions of that. I have a different kind of approach, uh, but same philosophy. Um, that is, what's an end-to-end -end model? Well, it needs to be able to accept forcing from the climate dynamically, right, in some form. So either downscaled information or something, you need to be able to feed that in so you can run warming scenarios, um, uh, high turnover scenarios, whatever scenarios you'd like. It has to be multi-species at all the key trophic levels, but that could be two, as you'll see in a minute. Um, uh, some kind of top predator should be included, and the fisheries, if it's in there, should be state-dependent, which means it's not just F. It's not just the mortality. It's responding to the conditions that are there. That's my definition, but, but this was kind of cobbled together from a variety of people, including uh, Beth Fulton and others, uh, in a workshop we had to define end-to-end -end models. So we're not immune from that either. So the challenge is, how do you combine these models that are often developed separately and on different scales together. And it turns out there is no theory for doing that, right? Um, uh, this is where some people get upset because modeling becomes an art. Um, there is not a recipe for doing that. Then we want to include human dimensions to make a dynamic top predator. And you have to work across a lot of disciplines. And uh, it becomes quite a challenge. Uh, you can't read that, but this was a a paper we did in, from a workshop in England, end-to-end -end models for the analysis of marine ecosystems, challenges, issues, and next steps, and those were all the authors. And you can imagine, every author has to agree to the version that's submitted, right? The re journals require that. So just, I shouldn't say manipulating these people, that's a bad way to put it. <laughs> just um, getting a version that everyone approved of uh, is, is a real uh, interesting experience in um, dealing with people. So what's, what's the issue with the scales? Well, this is a, a great diagram uh, that Dickey came up with. Horizontal spatial scales and time scales, seconds to century and millimeters to 10,000 kilometers. And this is just a variety of processes that when you're building one of these models, you have to think about. And it's climate all the way at one end. And for those from the West Coast, ENSO is, is always very popular. Uh, down to molecular processes and individual movement. So you can see that I'm going to tell you about an individual-based end-to-end model that accepts climate information. So we're dealing from this scale all the way up to that scale. So what do you include? What do you not include? And how do you include it? Right? There's been a variety of end-to-end -end models. Here's an Atlantis. The one I'm going to tell you about, I think, is on here. And it's called Nemero. And it's the only... Actually, it's not out there. Huh. It's here. It is the only one of its kind, um, whereas the others uh, have become much more popular. So keep that in mind as I describe it to you. Uh, what we decided to do was to say uh, we were in a meeting in Tokyo, and they said, you can't build an end-to-end -end model that's individual-based. And we, we said, well, I think we, we can. And that led to uh, a sustained effort, sometimes often unfunded, but still a lot of fun to try to build one. We said, well, where should we start? Well, sardine anchovy have these great decadal cycles uh, worldwide, uh, both in eastern boundary and western boundary current systems upwelling. Uh, and there's lots of information about them. And, 
It also turned out it, it was a good case study because not only are the forage fish tightly coupled from below, uh, but there's a lot of interest now in forage fish. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't foresee that coming, but uh, if you're familiar with the Lenfest report and others, forage fish has gotten a lot of attention. So whereas we used to call them fish food for other fish, um, they now have they're the kind of their own gravitas uh, as forage fish. Uh, and there's great cycles that do it. And what's nice is recently uh, people like Dave Checkley and, uh, and others have not just looked at temporal cycles, but there's a spatial aspect to the temporal cycles. So that led us to you know, get beyond the Lock of Altera-like model and deal with space, which we wanted to do. So this is a paper that's in press now that I'm going to briefly describe to you. And it's a demonstration of a, a lot of adjectives up there, but fully coupled end-to-end -end model for small pelagic fish. And again, the, sec the thing to note again is the number of authors involved, even in just this one model. Um, and and uh, from all over the place, by, by the way. But that was, that was our choice. Uh, uh, Sinichi Ito from, he's now at University of Tokyo. Miguel from FAO Rome. Vera from Nature Conservancy. Some of you probably know Cisco Werner from NOAA Fisheries. The old timers might recognize Alec McCall on there and others. Uh, and we got together multiple times and built this model. And these were all uh, organizations that gave us travel support as well as a NOAA cameo for a two-year period to really make a dent on it because they, they thought it was a good idea. So these are the cycles we're talking about. And um, uh, these are four different systems. That's the system we're going to work in Japan, uh, off of Chile and Peru and the Benguela, 1920 to almost 2000. And uh, you can see the sardine and anchovy out of phase somewhat out of phase here, though they both coexist here. Uh, at other times, uh, when it's, they're high here, blue, they were not high here, et cetera. So you have these very nice teleconnected cycles, and we're going to focus on this one. Uh, right now, uh, we've sent the model over to Sunichi Ito in Japan, and he's going to see if just by changing some of the biology, because it's Japanese sardine and stuff like that, uh, and the driving variables, can he generate these cycles that they've seen in Japan? And it's a really good test because, uh, if I can find the pointer again, because uh, when, when we had anchovy low, they should be, uh, in California current, they should be high in Japan. And uh, my guess is it won't, the model won't do that, that there's other things going on we don't have in there. But um, that's when we learn a lot about it. What's also nice about the California current is the Cal Coffee database goes way, way back. And these are just egg surveys. The key here is that this is 1952. And that, that project, although reduced, continues to this day. Unfortunately, in this talk, that's the only data you're going to see, because uh, I don't have time to show you the model data stuff we did. But there's a whole other paper where we compared it to a lot of the Cal Coffee data, which for those who, as you work in the Gulf, you know that long-term monitoring is not only hard to get funded, hard to maintain, and yet when something bad happens, everyone looks for baseline. And um, uh, Cal Coffee has managed to, to set up an amazing baseline uh, there. Oops. These are some of the gang who worked on it. Uh, this is uh, Salvador from Mexico and Sinichi from Japan. They were visiting me at one time during Mardi Gras. So I took them to Mardi Gras, and they thought that was, uh, they loved it, but they thought it was one of the stranger things they've been to. So, uh, <laughs> um, so where are we on the scheme of end-to-end -end models or even population models? So this is a classic uh, population model here, stage-based. It could be age-based. This was an ecosim model by field of the California current, and we're somewhere in between here. And you'll see we're going to couple a bunch of models with individuals to come up with a relatively simple food web, or really a multi-species model, but that has a lot of detail in those species, which is a little different than trying to model all the species simply, or only model one species in, in detail. Right? So why do an individual-based model for fish? Seems like a lot of work. Um, First of all, it's a natural unit in nature, and it allows for local inter interactions. And, and so that's that spatial part of the sardine anchovy 
things. Not everywhere in the California current do sardine do the same thing. Um, fish have complicated life histories, and uh, there's things about size-based interactions that instead of a Eulerian biomass kind of approach, individuals makes it easier to do, as well as movement, which is going to be a big topic here. On the other hand, it's, it's extremely computationally uh, challenging to model all the individuals, a lot of sardine and anchovy out there, um, as well as there are data needs that aren't always available, such as uh, individual decisions that fish make. So there's ups and downs to it. So here's the model. It's, uh, for those who, who know ROMS, it's all built within the ROMS model. That's the Regional Oceanographic Modeling System. It's a popular 3D hydrodynamics uh, open source code. Uh, NEMERO, for those who know about the Pisces effort in, uh, for the North Pacific, that was a group of us who built an NPZ model that we then people applied um, in uh, probably 30 or 40 places now. Um, then, so those are not new. Uh, this is new, uh, multi-species IBM for fish, and this is kind of new. We did a fishing fleet dynamics. So what I want to show you, kind of briefly, but but uh, I'll have the manuscript uh, is is uh, now is available. Is remember, Rams is three-dimensional. Here's the California current. Um, uh, water actually, uh, it's fairly complicated, but there's an upwelling system here. So uh, Ekman transport, right, with the prevailing winds, pushes water away from the shore. Cool nutrient-rich water gets, gets pulled up to replace it and stimulates phytoplankton growth. So it's a highly productive system with a rapid turnover rate. Um, if there's physical oceanographers, they're cringing at that description of an of a eastern boundary current system. But that's fundamentally what, what is good enough. And then, of course, uh, there's multiple layers, uh, 42 throughout this whole grid. If you're familiar with sigma layers, I hate them. Uh, sigma layers means there's always 42 layers, no matter how deep it is. And when it gets shallow, uh, the layers get squashed together. So a layer is not always at the same depth, which <laughs> makes, really makes it complicated. You tell you, layer three can be at any number of depths, depending where you are in the grid. Right? And they have a way to cross-reference that. And we're going to do a uh, 900-second time step, and we are going to run this for 50 years. And we're going to start in 1958, uh, well, 59, and go to 2009 at 900 second time steps with wind forcing and everything from that historical reanalysis uh, products that are available. On each of those cells in 3D is one of these classic NPZ models, which is a biomass based, or in this case, uh, micromoles nitrogen, same idea. Uh, and these are the classic, you integrate light with depth, there's nutrient limitation, the zooplankton eat the phytoplankton, nutrients get recycled, etc. So that's a, what we call a Eulerian model on each grid cell. So there's thousands of these running because there's one on each grid cell. Then we do the fish and we do sardine and anchovy and we actually model the individuals from birth to death. And we keep track of them with a technique called super individuals because we can't model every individual. And I won't go into a lot of details, but basically you have a statistical representation of the individuals that are there. But you do it with a much smaller number of individuals. So there's a constant scaling back and forth of what a model individual is doing and how that contributes to what the population level is doing. And we also do a migratory predator, which is like an albacore, and they come in, they eat these individuals. So we have individual albacore eating individual sardine and anchovy uh, during the season when albacore are there. Um, and that's, it, the bookkeeping was really challenging here because we're also going to do this on a supercomputer with uh, multiple processors. And for those who are familiar with that, one processor can't see what the other one's doing until you update everything. And so we got, you have a predator near the, on a cell and the prey on another cell, and if they go to different processors, how does that predator eat that prey item? So you get involved with a lot of computational issues um, that luckily uh, I didn't have to solve because we had people who, who are far better at doing that, uh, working on that, and it was tricky. A lot of linked lists and all these things that go on. So we do a full life cycle, which is easy to say, but it's a bookkeeping challenge. You can't keep adding individuals to the population, it'll blow up. So you take them out when they get too old and you replace the ones with the empty slots and the arrays with the new ones, but there's too many eggs, then there are slots. And so you have to do this whole uh, maintaining mass balance. You know, 
we are fisheries, but we still believe in mass balance, right? And it is one of the laws that we, we have to obey. And so we do growth, development, reproduction, mortality, and movement of each individual. And there's thousands and thousands of these. And it's done, uh, uh, in, I think in these runs, every 900 seconds for 50 years in three dimensions. Right? And so it's quite a complicated model. Each of these pieces, you know, that's just a bioenergetics model for an individual. It could be the Wisconsin version, if you're familiar with that. It could also be dynamic energy budget, which is the European version of, of that. Uh, mortality, we have constant rates and per day. So an individual looks like an individual. It, it uh, moves, etc. But it's all done in these coupled models. And then the fourth model is an individual-based, uh, or they would call it agent-based, the economists. Same, same idea. Fishing fleet, where we have 100, ports and five bo- uh, 100 boats and five ports. And uh, this is where the economists helped me, and we did it. And I'm just going to say what it says because I don't really... It's an expected net revenue model, and it has some other name that they always use. But basically, we have gas prices. We have motoring time. Uh, we have... Uh, each fisherman keeps track of where they think they caught fish last time, uh, and they go back to that place first. And uh, the advantage to this one is these are all day boats. So we, they had to get back in 24 hours, which helped a lot. They didn't have to make decisions whether to stay out longer or not, which in many fisheries they do, and that's a tougher decision. Um, and so these individual boats are going after the individual sardine. And the individual albacore are going after the individual sardine and anchovy. And the anchovy and sardine are trying to eat the zooplankton and seeing the temperature from the model below it. And the physics moves around eggs and larvae as particles, passive transport, with vertical movement. And then we're going to move around. Oh, I left out movement. How could that be? We'll get to that. So big fish don't go where the water goes. Right? And if you're not sure about that, think of migrating salmon. Right? They're going against the current, right? So uh, we have a behavior algorithm for the juveniles and adults. And I'm going to show you that in a second in more detail because it's really tricky. But uh, that if, if I was starting out now, uh, I would work on uh, modeling movement. I think it's a, it's, it is just starting to take off, and um, the, the measurements are just rapidly getting better and better. And fundamentally... Most in marine systems, climate change effects will be movement. The critters are going to move somewhere. 